promises and, and God's word and, and songs like that that remind us that we're not alone in the difficult times. And so wherever you find yourself this morning, if you're a believer, I want you to know that the Lord is with you. And whatever storm that you may be exiting in the middle of or getting ready to go into, you won't do it alone. Amen. Thank you, Brother Carroll. If you would, open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. This morning, we're going to have the third and final installment in this series, Stronger, Deeper, Wider, which is actually our year kind of focus as a church. Uh, stronger in Christ, deeper with one another in our church, and wider in our community. So this morning, we're going to be talking about being wider and, and looking outward into our community for the sake of Jesus. Before we get started, though, on my way in this morning, someone asked me if I jumped ship. And I, I thought, that's an odd question. I just blew it off and came in. And the next person that saw me said, hey, McFly. <laughs> and then it hit me. I'm wearing a life preserver. Um, I thought these were in fashion, but apparently 1985 called, and it, it wants its life preserver back. So um, if you see me leaving in a DeLorean this morning, maybe you should be worried, but um, I don't know. I thought it looked cool. So did McFly, though, right? All right, let's get that out of the way. I know I'm wearing a life preserver. Okay, let's, let's move on. Now, uh, this morning as we think about others, as we think about what we're called to do as God's people, as the people of, of the Lord, as Christians, Christ followers, I want to read you a quote that is from one of my favorite authors and pastor, David Platt. He says this, We are settling for a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves. When the central message of Christianity is actually about abandoning ourselves. Now let's let that sink in for a minute. We are settling for a Christianity that is all about self-centeredness, self-absorption. Is this going to help me? Is this good for me? Is this my, what I like? Is this what I want? And really what we're called to be as a Christian is selfless, looking out at those around us. And this morning, obviously, we're talking about going wider in our community. We often talk about how we're Jesus to the world, and that is true. I mean, when Jesus left, he left us here to be his hands and feet, and how we are supposed to minister on the behalf of our Lord because he is in heaven preparing a place for us, but he has gifted us with his Holy Spirit so that we can, in turn, act on his behalf here on earth. So if we really are the hands and the feet and the hearts of Jesus on this earth, I wonder how often do we really use our hands and our feet and our hearts to serve our neighbor. You know, it's funny how we're willing to go on short-term mission trips. The excitement of going overseas somewhere, or maybe even uh, just uh, to Mexico or Canada or somewhere in Central or South America, and we get excited about that and ministering to people we've never met or ne have never seen. Or, you know, we, we look forward to events and activities like serving with Matthew 25 and, and other ministries like this, and of course are, are great things. And those are wonderful experiences in our Christian life that if you have the opportunity to participate in, you should. It's interesting, though, how willing we are to do that, and yet it's difficult for us to minister to the people that we share a property line with. Why is that? Why is it that we think about missions as, you know, we look at the back wall of our auditorium here with letters from all over the world from our missionaries, men and women who have given their lives to go outside of the United States to preach the gospel. And we are a church that gives to missions. Last year, over $10,000 was given and designated specifically to missions, specifically as mission offering. Uh, and, and that total of missions giving that we give every year is around thirty-five dollars or $36,000 a year to foreign missions and for some missions here even in the United States. Wonderful things. We should be a part of that. We should be a part of sending the gospel all around the world. But I think as 
is American Christians, we have forgotten that our call is to reach our neighbor. To not just look to places like Burma, as, as he talked about, or Iraq, or Mexico, or India, or the Philippines. But to look next door. You know, sending our missions overseas is less messy. Uh, going on a short-term mission trip or going to Matthew 25 for an afternoon is, is less of a commitment than it takes to actually involve ourselves in the life of someone who lives right next door or right above us or right below us. We as individuals, first of all, we talked about being stronger in Christ. We must abide in Christ where it all starts. As Christian people, we have to be abiding in Jesus, centering ourselves in his will and his focusing our attention on him every day. And then as we do that, the love of God will outflow from our hearts to our brothers and sisters and also to those who don't know Jesus yet. It is a natural outflow. And this morning, as we consider going wider in our community, for you and me, going wider is as simple as going next door. That's where we need to start. And here's the question for this morning. Here's what I want us to consider as we look at the Word of God. Here's the question. Will you ask God to give you a burden for the ones who live closest to you? Picture them for a moment. Picture your neighbor. Think of their name. Think about all the things that you like about what they do and that annoy you. But this is a soul that Jesus has died for. And I believe that if we're going to start, we need to start right there. Today we're going to hear the words of Jesus about the most important thing we can do in our life. Love God and love our neighbor. In Matthew chapter 22, we're going to begin reading in verse 34. And we're going to read through verse 40. This is an encounter that Jesus has as we're going to read with a lawyer. Not kind of like we think about law, not an expert in civil law necessarily, but an expert in the law of God, the law of Moses. Jesus has this conversation with this expert who we get a hint here is trying to trip him up. And let's see how Jesus answers this man. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Maybe he said it with a different em emphasis. Maybe he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is God's word for us today, and it's a, it's a word that may be familiar to you, passage of some verses that maybe you've heard before. Whether you've heard them a million times or if it's the first time you've heard that, Jesus has spoken, and he says, this is the great the great command. The great command is to love God and love your neighbor. So as we consider that this morning, let's begin with praying. and Let's ask God to open our hearts to what Jesus is saying. Now, I know we think we know this, this passage, and, and we do. Lots of us know this. And it's not a matter of this morning if we know what it says. It's a matter of, am I willing to be obedient to what it says? It's not just enough to know what the Bible says. Scholars can figure that out. But what, what matters is God's people, are we going to do what he has said? So let's ask the Lord to help us to be obedient to that this morning. Our Father, we thank you for this day and this time together. 
Lord, it's been so good to be, be here already. Lord, it was exciting to sing about what you did for us at Calvary. Father, we know the price that you paid in sending your only begotten Son that shed his blood at Calvary. And that mercy there was great. And grace was free. Pardon for our sins was multiplied. There our burdened souls found liberty for what Jesus did at Calvary. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the price you paid so that we can have eternal life. And then, Lord, we were able to <clears throat> praise you from our lips and from the breath that you have put in our lungs, Lord. Every breath we take, Father, is a, is a gift from you. And Lord, as that comes into our lungs, and we want to express with our words praise to you. And Lord, I hope you heard that this morning. I hope you didn't just hear it, but you saw it in our hearts. We do thank you for your life-giving power. Father, we thank you that we never go alone through this life, that you're always with us, even through the hardest times, the storms. And Lord, with all these blessings, with having you with us, Lord, I pray that you would help us as your people to focus, to zero in on the, the great command to love you with every part of our being, and in turn to love our neighbor. Lord, I pray that you would convict us of this this morning. Remind us where we need to be reminded. Explain it. Shed light in our hearts, Lord, so that when we walk out of this room, we begin to demonstrate love for our neighbor. And Lord, that our lives would demonstrate love for you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so if we go back into this passage, we go back to the first verse we looked at. We want to walk through the Word of God. We see here that the Pharisees were pretty excited that Jesus had put, sent the Sadducees running. See, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were two different types of religious leaders. They were both religious leading groups, okay? And they both had very particular and staunch beliefs about uh, what God wanted for his people through the law of Moses, through even their own kind of additional traditions that they built these two groups of religious leaders kind of competed against one another to see who was really faithful and uh, committed to God and who really knew his word the best. So when the Pharisees got word that Jesus sent the Sadducees running, they were excited because now they were going to come and they were going to show the Sadducees how to trap Jesus, how to get him to say something that might ensnare him so that they could finally arrest him and try to show the world the fraud that they believed he was. I think in a way, too, the Pharisees were kind of wondering if they might learn something, although they weren't humble enough to admit that they could. But they come to Jesus. They're ready to ask a question. So who do they send? They don't send a lackey, right? They don't send a goat. Now, you know, in our day and age, we think of goat as the greatest of all time, but in the U.S. military academy, the goat is the lowest on the totem pole. So they don't send the lackey, they don't send the goat, they don't send the, the dingbat, maybe. They send a lawyer, the expert, the expert in the law of Moses, the guy who knew it forward and backward. There is someone in this room this morning who can say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious backwards. That's insane. That means you listen to that way too much, okay? They're an expert in all things Disney. Now, here we have an expert in the law of Moses. Somebody who just, I mean, they can do it in their sleep. They know exactly what God has said. And so they're going to send their best to try to trip up Jesus. The law of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All those five books were kept in memory by these lawyers. There were 613 documented commands in the Old Testament law. 613 documented commands. Want to break them down even further? Listen to this. 248 were positive. Thou shalt. 
or you should do this. Get this, 365 are negative. One negative comment for every day, right? One negative command for every day. Today, I will not, you know. Um, that's just how, that's how it was parsed out. Positives, negatives, but 613 commands, and they knew them all. And you know what? A good lawyer knows all the loopholes too, don't they? They know all the ways around the laws, right? They know how to skate around with some words, how to, how to trip people up, how to get somebody on the stand to say something they didn't want to say. These are experts. And since it would be impossible to keep 613 commands, I mean, we tried to boil it down to 10 and we still messed that up. But since it's impossible to keep 613 what the Pharisees did, the lawyers, they said, okay, there are some that are way more important than others. And if you're good at keeping those, well, then you're good. And the other ones are not such a big deal, so if you mess up on those, it's, it's okay. Sounds like us, doesn't it? But they were curious about Jesus' opinion. And so he asked the question in verse 36, Master. And we have to put the emphasis on the word thee, Right? which is the great commandment in the law. There's 613. Jesus, tell us which one that we should put at the top of the list. Which command should we make sure that we have down, that we don't mess this up, that if there's one that we never, ever mess up, tell us which one it is. We want to focus in so that we make sure we don't get that one wrong. You know, how we look at life has a lot to do with how we would answer this. I mean, we know the answer because it's right here in the Bible. It's been there for thousands of years, ever since Jesus spoke it. But if someone were to come to you and say, what is the greatest command of all that God gave? Or maybe if someone said, what's the greatest law of the land and here in America? What's the greatest law? You know, it all depends on your perspective, how you would answer that. Because we all see life in different lenses. Listen, if you're a competitive person, and you see life as a competition, wins and losses, right? If everything to you is about a win and a loss, you would put more weight on the laws that prohibit others from getting an advantage over you. The perfect illustration for that is sports. Think about a football game. We've got two games coming up today. We have the GOAT, right, going to be playing today. We have two football games coming up. Think about football. There are laws, there are rules in a football game that make, make it positive, make it sure that one team does not get an advantage over another. Pass interference. You can't hold a guy down. You can't, get in his, you can't knock his arms down. You can't interfere with the pass because that gives you an advantage over him. Holding, all right? Holding, defense, right? You can't do that because that gives you an advantage. You hold on to the defender, and your guy can run right past him. Illegal. False start. Seems kind of benign, but, you know, if you, if you get a head start on the other team, that's a, di that's a disadvantage for the defense because it's all based on rules and a competition, winning and losing. And if I view life as a competition, I'm going to focus more on what would prohibit others from getting an advantage over me. If I view life as a formula to get it right or to be on the right side, who, get, who determines who's on the right side? I always do, right? But if I view life as a formula to be on the right side of things, I will put more emphasis on the laws that differentiate good people from bad people. I will, I will focus in on that. I will obsess over that. I will obsess whether or not they're good or bad. One is winning and losing. The other one is good or bad. Are they good? I'm always good, but they're bad. And if they're like me, then they're good. See, these are the things we focus on. We don't even realize it. If we desire peace and civility, then we'll put more weight on laws that prohibit violence and vandalism and laws that promote quiet and order. 
what we value most would determine what, how you and I would answer this question. What's the most important thing? So it's interesting how Jesus answers this. question is, what does God really want from us? If we want to put it in those terms, what does God really demand of his people? And Jesus replies with one single command with two implications. Get that. It's one command with two implications. It's like a coin with two sides. One coin, can't divide a coin and pay with half. One coin, two sides. Jesus says in verse 37, you want to know what the number one thing that you should do is? He says, okay, I'll tell you, you shall love the Lord your God with all. Everybody say all. Your heart. With all. Say all. Thy soul. And with thy mind. And then he says in verse 38, this is the first and great command. This gets more emphasis than anything else in life. If you want to boil this down, you should emphasize loving God. Think about the Ten Commandments, right? Narrow it down to ten. How many do we have that deal with God? One, two, three, four. Or that deal with God. The first four commands are all about our relationship with God. The last six are all about our relationship with others. You see, Jesus answered this the way he did because of his love for his Father and his understanding of the supremacy of God. There's only one who deserves your undivided devotion. And that's God. Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy 6.5. I think we have it up there. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Deuteronomy 6.5. Jesus just quoted the law. Now these three parts, heart, soul, mind, they're three parts. They're uni- unified and diverse. They're, they're together and they're separate. They're all a part of who we are. So I want to ask you this morning, if the most important thing in life, if the number, the number one command is to love God with every bit of my heart, with every bit of my soul, and with every bit of my mind, I want, to, I want us to answer this question between you and God this morning. Do you love God? I want to say yes. I want to believe I do. And then we have to ask this question. What evidence is there of that claim? What evidence is there that I love God? If someone looked at my life, would there be enough evidence where they would say, kind of a strange bird, but they sure do love their God. When they look at our social media, because that's what what everybody shows their life right now, right? I mean, that's, that's how we put our life on display. If they were to look at our post and what we say and what we, what we value, would they say that person loves God? What about your heart? Does it belong to Jesus? Your heart belongs to someone or something. We had a wonderful men's prayer breakfast yesterday. I mean, we had 25 guys there. How many pounds of bacon? What was it? Seriously. Seriously. 10 pounds of bacon. And I'm not joking, there wasn't one strip left. That's just gross and awesome at the same time, you know? We had delicious eggs made in bacon grease. 
<laughs> it's getting spiritual, right? I mean, we had biscuits and gravy. I mean, like, we don't, you know, we don't, we had grapes and, and bananas to even it out. Um, there was a lot of those left over, by the way. I just, I did notice um, coffee, Coke, right? I mean, we had it all, right? This isn't a ladies' prayer breakfast. We didn't have pastries, you know, and quiche, you know. We had bacon and biscuits and gravy and Coke and coffee, and we didn't even have any cream and sugar, man. We did, but at our, I'm just getting off point because it's really good, but at our, pre- at our uh, prayer breakfast, Dave gave the devotion, and <laughs> it was good, man, almost as good as the food. Uh, it was better. I have to say that because I'm the preacher. But he, he did the devotion about the word devotion. One time in the Bible, I didn't know this. It was mentioned one time. That word is used one time in the Bible when Paul is in Athens and he says, I beheld your devotions, your worship, where your heart is. I could tell the heart of Athens by walking down the street. It was everywhere. What, what was it? Idols. It was clear. And when I walk down the street of your social media, or when you look down the street of my social media, or when you watch me out among people, what do you behold as my devotions? More importantly, what does he behold as our devotion? Because we can fake it. A lot of us have gotten really good at that. We know how to play it sad, but man, we know how to play it. And God, you know, we just, need to, we just need to humble ourselves and say, Lord, it's been a game, and I hate it. I hate when I'm hip, hip, uh, being a hypocrite. I hate when I'm pretending to be somebody I'm not. And Lord, I really want to make an effort to make it about you. Maybe that's your heart this morning. I want you to know he's ready for that. He wants to hear that out of your mouth, and most importantly, he wants to see it in our heart. Maybe that would be your decision today. To love God with your heart, soul, and mind. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart, guard thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Everything starts in the heart. Further, Matthew 15.18 says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. If you want to know, hey, if you want a mirror of your heart, listen to your words. And nowadays we can actually read our own words, can't we? Scroll through your own social media and look at what the words are. If the words me and I are the most prominent words, that might tell us something, right? We, we may need to make a, an evaluation of who or what we really love. The words we speak, the words we put on our phone come from our heart. And they are an accurate gauge of what is in our heart, according to Jesus. So the question is, how do I develop a heart for God? I want to have a heart for God, but I struggle with it. You know, I I get caught up in my routine. I get caught up in, in my desires and my comfort and what I want. And how do I develop a heart that, that is centered and focused on God. Is it even possible? First of all, yes, it is. It is possible to have a heart for God. How do I get it? It's something that, you know what, nobody's got down pat, first of all. It doesn't matter how many right now media videos they have or how many subscribers they have to their YouTube or how many people they have attending their church. There's no one that has this down pat. Nobody. How do we seek after and how do we endeavor to keep and have a heart for God? Here it is. Here's some things we can do. Endeavor to know more about him. God is, is is the person that when you do get to know about him, you will begin to love him. Really. People say that to know him is to love him, right? We say that in weddings and retirements, right? All to know him is, but God is really that way. When you get to know him, you will love him. And you say, well, this, there's so many hypocrites and so many people that, that really give him a, a bad reputation. I agree, and that's why you should find out for yourself. I agree 
There are so many people, myself included, from time to time, who give God a bad rap. And so quit looking around at others and saying, well, they, don't, you know, they say they love God, but they don't, so I'm not going to. No, no, no. Find out for yourself. You get a relationship with him. You get into his word. You read what it says about him. You read all about him and tell me if you don't love him. Endeavor to learn more about him. That's one way we can get a heart for God. Another way is talking to him through prayer. There's such a peace that comes with prayer. I was in my living room this morning. We have over our piano there that no one in our house plays a, um, you know, that's just a de- decoration. Um, we have this little thing that has like hymn pages on it. And one of them is Sweet Hour of Prayer. And this morning as I was standing there in, in my living room, I was looking at that hymn. I was, there's like five of them. And I was like, which one of those is my favorite? And I went through them and I came back to that one because of how rich and sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care bids me at my father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in seasons of distress and grief my soul has often found relief such peace in prayer you can get to know God more by studying his word finding out about him for yourself and talk to him He's real. And I want you to know that he loves you. And he knows you. And he hears you. Talk to him. We can find out about him in his word. We can talk to him through prayer. And I got to say this. One of the ways that we can really get to know God, another way we can get to know God, is just being with his people. By the way, we are all supposed to have his spirit, right? If you're born again, you have his spirit. We are the body of Christ. And so when I'm with believers, it should give me a better picture of who God is. It should. It should give me a better picture of who he is. Friday night, we had a memorial service for a young man who was in our youth group when I was a youth leader. He's just 36 years old and had some troubles in life, some struggles. And... Um, it was overcame, overcame him. And there at the memorial service, I listened to songs that his, his brother and his stepmom and people who knew him well sang songs, not about him, about the Lord. And I listened to testimonies of people who knew him well, his dad, his pastor, his youth leaders. And in the middle of that tragedy... I want you to know my faith was encouraged. Because I heard people giving testimony of the strength of God in hard times. That in the, and when they received the phone call that every parent in the world dreads would ever come their way. When they received the phone call, and, and the lady even said, instead of crumbling into a ball and falling on the ground, which is what I wanted to do, I looked at my husband and I said, the Lord is with us. That encouraged me. I need to hear stuff like that. And you know the only way I'm going to hear that is being with God's people. That's why we do this. That's why we get together for fellowships and studies and and in the Word, because we need to hear from each other to encourage each other's faith. This is how we know more about God, and this is how we get a heart for God. Continuing on, getting to our thrust this morning, Jesus says in verse 39, the other side of the coin. And the second is like unto it. The second also includes love. It's right there next to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus is quoting Leviticus 19.18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why? Because I am the Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's not that there are two great commands. There's one. We see evidence of this in 1 John 4, 20. Look at this with me. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, 
He's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother who he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? That's not conjecture. That's inspired word of God. Spoken right out of the mouth of God himself. We cannot love God if we're not loving our neighbor. And vice versa. That's why they're connected. That's why you can't separate them. That's why they're the same, they're two sides of the same coin. If you love God, you will love your neighbor. If you do not love your neighbor, you cannot say that you love God. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? If I were to look at the way I love the people around me, not my family, that I mean I'm, you know, that you just are supposed to care for, not even necessarily my church family. I'm talking about the people just around me, my neighbor. Remember the question one asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? Remember how Jesus responded to that? Rocked their world. Your neighbor's the person in need, whoever that is. Doesn't care, doesn't matter what their skin color is, their political allegiance, their ethnicity, their culture. None of that matters. Who is around you in need? That's your neighbor. Wow. Love that person. If eternity is real and heaven and hell are real, are they? You know what's heartbreaking for me? The evidence shows that I don't necessarily believe that. That's hard to admit. But if I'm being honest this morning about myself, my own heart, the evidence shows I don't really believe that because if I did, what would I be doing to help people, help my neighbor? To know Jesus so they can have eternal life. Do I love my neighbor? Maybe your neighbor is in the apartment or unit next to you, above or beneath you. In my case, I have one who I'm pretty sure is born again. <laughs> the other one might be. I'm still trying to find that out. They're 50 feet away from me. What about the person that's 50, 60, 80 feet away from you? On a regular basis, they're just literally right there. What evidence is there in my life that I really love that person? If I'm going to go wider in my community, it has to start, in my case, 50 feet away. I think that's where it should start. You know, it's mostly been ambiguous for you and me as, as Christians. I don't, I don't mean Christians. I mean as like um, evangelicals, people who say, you know, we have a heart for, for the lost. We say it. We even believe it. It's been ambiguous because we say, oh, I want to reach my community. And we do. And we should. But it's easy to say, I want to reach my community. We don't know their faces. We don't know their names. We don't know their situations. And it's easy to say, we need to reach them. But it's for whatever reason, why don't we just look 50 feet away? Why don't we just look, you know, 10 feet away? If, if you're in an apartment or a condo or town or across the hall. Why don't we start there? Why is it? It's because it's messy, man. It means I actually have to care about somebody other than me. And man, God is beating me up about this right now. The relationship right next door. The needs right next door. Let's start with those. We have to start somewhere. Instead of letting the missionaries send us letters talking about who they're reaching to make sure... It's almost like a progress report. We check up on our missionaries to make sure that our dollars and our prayers are paying off. Heaven help us. Really. I mean, I love getting the letters. I love hearing the encouragement. And I, I, to be honest with you, I, as a pastor, I started reading them with a critical spirit of, well, let's make sure that our, you know, they're, they're paying off. And God's been 
just tearing me up about this because God got a hold of my heart and said, why don't you write a letter? Why don't you write a letter to the missionaries and tell them who you read? Give them the names. Give them the faces. What if we had to write a letter to, to our supporting church? What if we had to bring a letter in here every month and we would stand up on a Wednesday night? All right. This letter is from Don Lakes. Man, we don't, you know. We're going to read this one from Pam Smith or Teresa Campbell. Gary, we're going to read their letter tonight. Oh, are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? What if we had to have our letter written or read? I want to quote a, a, a song for you. And we'll close with this. Gary, you can come. Um, here's the song. It's called Right Here. Jody, I think we have some of the... Start right here. Here's how it goes. I, now, this is the thrust, but I want you to listen to how this chorus goes, or this verse goes. Listen to this. This is like a dagger in my heart. It starts off with this. We want our coffee in the lobby. We watch our worship on a screen. We got a rock star preacher. Okay, thank you. Man. <clears throat> no, but it says we have a rock star preacher who won't wake us from our dreams. We want our blessings in our pocket. Now watch these last three lines. We keep our missions overseas. But for the hurting in our cities, would we even cross the street or the driveway or go up the steps if we're going to go wider in our community let's, let's be real it's a bunch of talk until we go next door if you'd stand with me please we need to beg God to give us a burden for our neighbor our hearts have been so cold we talk a big game, man. We care about missions. We give to missions. We want them overseas. We love that. And it should be, but something's not right if I'm not engaged in it myself personally. So right where you're at, unless the Lord is leading you, you're welcome to come up here and pray and take it to Him just as a public act to Him and to your brothers and sisters and say, Lord, I'm coming before you and I have to bring my heart to you and say it's been cold too long. Call out the name of your neighbor. Maybe you need to sit down in your pew or turn around in your pew and, and kneel or just there in the quietness of your living room. Think about that person that's 20, 30, 50, 100 feet away from you on your street. Start there. Oh God, give me a burden for my neighbor. Give me a burden for the people that are just right around me. Lord, I have faked it. I have pretended. I have... been hypocritical. I've, I've watched while others have been critical of their compassion. I've got people that live steps away from me that I've never really cared for. I pray, God, that you give me a radical love in my heart. That I quit caring about myself, my comfort, my wants, my desires, my appetites. I'm settling for a Christianity that's all about me, which is not even Christianity, instead of being like Jesus and heeding his call, his commission. Forgive me. Lord, I, 
I pray that as a church, that means every single one of us. That means me and my brother and my sister all throughout this room and those who are watching. Lord, that, that we would be a church. We would be individuals who love our neighbor. Let it start right here. In Jesus' name, amen.